Hey everyone, I'm Josh Olson, and today I'm going to be presenting my SciTech project. So what I want to do is I want to make a new kind of shingle that's, uh, that combats hail damage. And why, why we should care is because hail damage is such a widespread issue, and it's especially frequent in Colorado. <clears throat> and it's a financial burden for many homeowners alike. So I want to develop a product that's durable and cost efficient. So the objective, I want to use SolidWorks and I specifically want to use the simulations in order to find data on strain, stress, displacement, and elasticity. And I also want to use um, the program to create different compositions. I'm not limited by the materials that I can use, so I can use many and as many as I want to. Um, and I also want to use material science properties and principles such as Hooke's laws, the elasticity modulus, and anastrophy in order to show the relationship that materials have with pressure, or excuse me, with the impact force. I also want to use mechanics, which shows the physics of the, the physics side um, of the project, including the UL2218 test. I'll cover that more. Uh, in depth within the next few slides, and Newton's laws, specifically the net force equation, which say, says that the net force is equal to our mass times our acceleration. We're going to use that in order to find our um, impact force. And we also want to focus on our product product attributes. So we want to we want to see that it's not only affordable, but it's durable. Um, it's fire resistant and the mass can be supported by the roof. It's not too heavy and it's not too light. So some of the constraints. There were some variables that I couldn't find, including Poisson's ratio and the elastic modulus for um, specific materials such as fiberglass and for asphalt. And we should notice that hail properties are pretty inconsistent. So uh, for example, the size of it is pretty inconsistent, meaning that the volume isn't going to be consistent throughout. And that really does impact our calculations. Um, adhesive plies are pretty much excluded from SOLIDWORKS. Um, and plies again, those are our different layers. So one, two, three. And typically, um, yeah, you can add in a proxy. SOLIDWORKS is not going to recognize um, its adhesive properties though. So there is no point in even using that. So, and another issue is that SOLIDWORKS, when you put your force down, it assumes that it's even throughout, and that's typically not the case. Your force is oftentimes gonna be distributed unevenly. And so the surface, so I'm using the surface extrusion method, and I'll cover this more in depth and explain more of what I'm talking about, but it's limited in terms of where the fixtures can be placed, where the force can be placed, and all this stuff impacts our results. All right, moving on to prototyping. So initially, like, rather than making a shingle, I wanted to make a cover. And what I mean by that is that I wanted to make something that would go on top of the roof. It would, it would cover it, to say. Um, and so the design, uh, I was thinking of something that's sort of helical. And I would, how, would, how, how I would describe it is that it's kind of like a chain link fence. And in between these empty spaces right here, you have bubble wrap or like little sacks of air and it'll make much more sense once you see the design. So why I decided not to go with this is just because manufacturing this sort of apparatus would have been so difficult and it doesn't, um, and it would have cost a lot to make considering um, the geometry is kind of funky and it would require a lot more um, like designing, I guess, and much more effort to produce. There were attachment challenges as well um, on a roof, I didn't know where I was going to attach it. Is it going to go attached from the gutter and then go all the way to the peak of the house? I just wasn't completely sure about that. And uh, how the sacks would inflate, I didn't really know how. I thought with air, but I don't think that would have worked. Um, the simulation would have also been difficult to run on this, not only because I made it so weird, uh, but just because it's it was an assembly and I made it so that it couldn't be, it, it wasn't very good for um, simulations. 
So here's our cover right here. So this gray piping right here, that's where our air would have come in, right? And it would have gone to our um, sacks right here and they would have filled up. And right here on the bottom view, you can see that they're filled up right there. So initially they would have been deflated. So continuing on, I decided to go with composite materials because composite materials are when you have multiple materials that are chemically different and physically different and you combine them together to make a, a product that's much stronger. So you combine your matrix, which is typically something that's protective, and your fiber, which reinforces the strength of the product in order of the, excuse me, of the material and makes a stronger product overall. And keep in mind, uh, composites d obviously have um, distinct layers. So this one would be like asphalt, this fiberglass, etc. And it can be simulated in SolidWorks um, it can either be represented as a sandwich, which I didn't use, uh, symmetrical, and much more. So, and we can also see that there are some materials that are good with this. Uh, we can see that elastomers, which are just uh, elastic polymers, are really good. And uh, metals such as steel and metal alloys are really good with that. So I really wanted to experiment with those sorts of um, materials as well. So prerequisites. So before experimentation, I needed to find the impact force for the simulation. Uh, and so in order to do that, I needed to find, I needed to figure out what method I was gonna use in order to find it. So at first I'm like, I can just calculate it using the hailstone itself. Cause I know that hail, hailstones, um, they're formed in cumulonimbus clouds. And those are typically uh, 6,500 feet off the ground. And I would, I would find like the height of a roof and then subtract the two to find the vertical displacement and calculate original and final velocity using that. However, that method proved pretty inconsistent considering um, uh, roof sizes are typically not all the same. The pitch size might be different. That because um, uh, with, yeah, pretty much just what I just said and circle. Uh, so instead of doing that, I decided to go with the UL2218 industry test instead. And this is basically when you have a steel ball that's two inches in diameter and it drops uh, 20 feet off the ground. And uh, if your shingle survives it, that means it's pretty durable and it's safe for the market. And so with this test, we're given the, the, the diameter of the ball, the material of the ball, and like I mentioned, the diameter. This is all important because we can find we know the density if we know the material we know the volume if we know the the mass of the ball or excuse me the um diameter of the ball meaning we can find the mass if we find the mass we can apply newton's second law which states that um our net force is equal to our mass times our acceleration and we're assuming that acceleration is just our acceleration due to gravity which is 9.81 uh meters per second squared and then we can times our mass that we found using uh, using that equation for uh, density. All right, for experimentation, now that I've found my impact force, I decided to use the finite element analysis uh, software, or um, I, it's, it's something, this form of analysis that's present in SolidWorks. And it's basically, uh, where you can add your fixtures, your features, and other sort of forces that are found. And it bas it helps simulate real life applications, which is pretty important considering we wanna know how much hail is gonna impact it. And so there are two types of extrusions, our boss extrusion and our surface extrusion. Now, if you look over here, this is our surface, surface extrusion. It's a 2D plane, it's not 3D. And this is our boss extrusion, it's 3D. And you can add different um, stresses, or you can add forces uh, in fixtures that are parallel to each other. You cannot do that in our uh, surface extrusion. You can only have it on the sides. It can't be right in the center of it. And using that, we can find our stresses, our strains, our displacements, and our elasticity. We find elasticity by dividing our strains by our stresses divided by our strains. All right, so before I cover the metal alloy, um, I'd just like to cover the coloring over here. So you can see that 
it goes from a scale of red to blue. Red means that there's the the most displacement, uh, uh, displacement, strain, stresses, and other um, other sort of measurements are experiencing the most. And this and blue is the complete opposite, where it's like the values are at their lowest, meaning that the stress isn't as much, it's not as high, and um, displacement isn't as high either. All right. So moving on to the product that I made, this was my initial design where I only had fixtures on this side and this side and these two parallel sides didn't have any. So with that in mind, we can see that the regions of the highest stresses and strains were typically on the ends right here where the fixtures was. And what I used for the materials was I used fiberglass B for plies one and three. And I saw that plies ply one had much more uh, strain and stresses compared to ply three that's pretty much just because it's on top and it's it's really absorbing a lot of that impact and um uh moving on i also changed the angle dis uh, placement so and the this makes the the model anastrophic meaning that materials run in different directions materials with different properties run in different directions so for example fiberglass was 45 degrees and alloy steel is 90 degrees all right so after running that first test i really wanted to change the plies so instead of having the fiberglass be one and three i made metal alloy uh my first and my one two third uh ply and fiberglass became the second one. I also changed the force because the force just said one Newton. That is not representative of the steel ball that's just been dropped. So I changed that, ran the simulation again, and we can see that I fixed the fixtures. So every single side where you can see like these little green arrows, that means it's like held in place. Um, and unlike the last one where they're only on two sides, they're now on all four. I did that just because those two sides that didn't have it, they could flex down, and that really does impact displacement and other sorts of variables. All right, so if we look at the data, um, specifically, like, look at the, the coloration, right? And we're looking at those high values because at the highest values, we can see that um, this is most likely where fracturing can occur, and it's important to see, like, where this is going to happen. So if we look at displacement, and displacement, by the way, is how far out of shape something is. So if something goes from this to this, that's displacement. Uh, but it doesn't stay like that. It's not permanent uh, because it, it depends on the type of material. So with our metal alloy, metal in terms of its elasticity, it's gonna stay like that most likely because it can't, metal deforms, that's plastic deformation and it doesn't return back to its original state. And so we can see that displacement right here. And again, that just means the most material is being pushed down from, from equilibrium down. And so our strain, our strain is basically how much uh, an object is deformed. And we can see that it's, it's only deformed really on the edges right here. And we can see, and since it's anastrophic, right, um, we see more forces being dispersed throughout. So that's why we have like this sort of um, circular pattern right here with the blue and why green surrounding it is that it's dispersing that energy. And our stress. All right, and stress and elasticity are on the other page. Um, but on average, elasticity was 3.446 E plus 11. That's just their measure of how elastic it is that's just our stresses divided by our strains and its highest um was 4.337 e plus 11. and so what does this mean what, what does all this data mean so it basically tells us where our feet our fractures can be found any places where deformation is and it, it also it ultimately like makes you want to uh, change your design at that all right, like I mentioned, so here's our stress and our elasticity. So, and again, elas elasticity is our stress divided by strain. It basically measures how far a material is stretched, and it's crucial to our equilibrium, because what that means is that if something's elastic, it's more likely to return back to its normal state. So deformation 
or displacement, it doesn't turn to deformity. Deformity is when it stays like this. All right, and then Young's modulus, it's basically a graph that determines the yield strength. And so um, the slope of the graph is linear. That represents our uh, elasticity. However, um, as soon as that uh, linearity stops, that's our yield strength. And so what that means is just that um, anything after that uh, means that it would just break or fracture. So that's the ultimate strength that it can actually handle. So looking off over to the right, we can tell that it has a max elasticity of 4.377 E plus 11 in the middle. This is not a good sign. Um, mainly because, uh, especially with metal alloys, if it has that much uh, elasticity in the middle, and if it has that much displacement in the middle, that means it's much more likely um, to stay like that. So it's going to experience plastic deformation versus elastic. And that's something, especially in a shingle, we do not want to see. So my original thoughts were that, oh, it's, uh, it's metal, meaning that, oh, deformation is not likely because it's elastic. That is not the case. And this idea of anastrophic, so we can see that um, by change, this had zero uh, degrees per each angle or per each material. So each was at zero degrees. This one had 90. So our um, metal was at 90 degrees and our fiberglass was at 45 degrees. So ultimately it changes how much energy is dispersed and how it's dispersed and what sort of pattern that's in. And um, ultimately I, I was surprised by this, honestly. Um, even though like the overall elasticity is not impacted by it, it's just a, how it's dispersed throughout. All right. And then moving on to the asphalt shingle, uh, for one and three plies one and three, we had asphalt for our second one, we had fiberglass. And then looking at this, we can see that it has much lower numbers in comparison to our, uh, uh, to our metal alloy shingle. And what that means is that it's more, it can handle more stresses and strains easily in comparison. Because uh, if your number is a lot lower, because if you look over here, if it's a lot lower, um, that means it has stresses and strains that are much more, um, actually screw that. So how should we interpret this? So deformation occurs at the sides. If we look, if we want to look, right here with our strain. So that's like right here, that's where it's gonna deform. Uh, we can see that uh, dispersion is going off to our sides. So that, for, that impact force is being, uh, it's not centralized, um, it's actually being spread out. And with our stress, we can see that um, the force is acting on pretty much all, it's acting especially on the sides and in the middle. And so, unfortunately, though, this is not very representative of what um, an actual experiment would look like. Like I said, just because of those fixtures and other sorts of things, for example, the asphalt um, shingle ha or the asphalt had to be uh, manually typed in and whatnot. So refinement. So these are things that if I had more time, I would change or look into. I'd look at the impact of multiple shingles, like how how force is absorbed by not just one, but multiple. Um, I'd also look at adhesives, because maybe there there's a maybe there's a way you can make adhesives. I'm not completely sure about that. And I want to find a relationship between theta and impact force. So angle or shingles are typically at an angle. I want to see how that angle impacts impact force. And surface area, I kept all my shingles uh, six by six in order to keep consistency. And I want to see if air resistance is ever present. So in conclusion, so was the project e cheap or excuse me, economical and durable? Um, no, in all honesty, we can say that the shingles on the market are probably the better options in comparison, just because the cheaper material, such as your asphalt, and the asphalt I used specifically was probably the cheapest, um, was weaker and dur more durable materials such as the metal alloys costed a lot more. So in achieving that balance was difficult. Sure, 
Like you have your metal alloys, they're a lot stronger, but more expensive and prone to a uh, plastic deformation as I discussed. And asphalt is cheap, but modeling its effects was also hard considering you had to manually type in all its properties. All right, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for watching.